Welcome to this video on baptism preparation. This brief video is intended for parents who are about to have a child baptized and also for godparents. In this video, we will review many different topics. We'll review first Christ himself and why he wants us to be baptized. We'll go over when baptism should take place, where baptism should take place, how is baptism performed, what baptism is, and finally, we'll go over and review the roles of godparents and parents. Jesus Christ. Baptism comes from Jesus Christ. When Christ instituted the sacrament of baptism, he did so out of a heart filled with love, a burning love and mercy for us. It's Christ himself who gave us the sacrament. To understand it more deeply, let's go back to the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel. Well, the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament lived in a time when the temple of the Jews had been destroyed. There was no place to worship God, no place to offer sacrifice, no place to ask for forgiveness of sins. And Ezekiel prophesied that one day there would be a new temple. And from this temple, water and blood would flow from its east side. And this water and blood would be a life-giving remedy, a healing balm for the world. Now, this prophecy that Ezekiel uh, talked about came true in Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, the soldier, the Roman soldier, took a lance and pierced his heart. And what came out? Blood and water. The blood and water that brings the healing balm, the healing remedy for the world. When you think of the blood and water, you think of the sacraments, right? Blood, you think of the Eucharist. Water, you think of baptism. Christ is that new temple. He is the place we are reconciled to the Father. He is the place that we encounter the Holy Spirit. It's in him that we find forgiveness of sins. It's in him that we worship the Father in Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ is the new temple. In Matthew chapter 28, after Christ rises from the dead on the third day, he spent some time with the apostles. And after uh, uh, many days with the apostles, he ascends back into heaven. But right before he ascends his ascension, he tells his apostles one last command. He tells them, all power in heaven has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. The very last words of Christ to his apostles is, go out and baptize. Christ desires baptism. John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, Amen, amen, I say to you, and no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Right? Salvation depends and is much related to baptism. Baptism is necessary for salvation. Acts of the Apostles, we see over and over again, it revolves around the sacrament of baptism. We see the apostles and the deacons and the early priests going out and baptizing the nations. And we even see in Acts chapter 16, two occasions when even infants are baptized. When should baptism take place? Parents are to ensure that their infants are baptized within the first few weeks of birth. It's a beautiful tradition to make sure that your child is baptized on the eighth day after birth, right? Because the eighth day is when Christ was circumcised. The eighth day is an octave, a beautiful way to celebrate Christ's resurrection. But as long as it's done within the first few weeks of uh, birth, this is a fine. Now, if parents delay it too long, if they wait more than two or three months, it becomes a mortal sin. Why keep our child away from the life-giving remedy of God's grace? We must make sure that their children are baptized, preferably within the first two weeks, uh, and not longer than a month, maybe two, uh, after birth. Now, where should baptism take place? A baptism should always take place in a Catholic church and should only be performed by a Catholic priest or Catholic deacon. We should never have our child baptized in any other denomination. Now, in an emergency, anyone can baptize. So imagine you come upon a car wreck and someone's dying and they say, I've never been baptized. Please baptize me. And you don't you don't have time to call a priest or deacon before the person expires and dies. You can perform the baptism and you should perform the baptism. And we'll go over how to do that. So in an emergency, anyone can baptize. Again, only in an emergency. Now, how does baptism take place? If you have to perform a baptism in an emergency, 
and it would be a good idea to eventually teach your children how to do this too, is to make sure first you have water, preferably holy water. If you don't have time to get holy water, have any kind of natural water. Make sure the person is unbaptized, right? Baptism can only take place one time. In natural life, you were born in this world once. In supernatural life, you're only born once. And so it would be a sacrilegious sin to be rebaptized if you were validly baptized in the first place. But if an unbaptized person desires baptism and they're on their deathbed, about to die before you have time to get a priest or deacon there, then you could perform it. So you need water, an unbaptized person, and then you pour the water on their head. You pour the water on their head, not in their hands, not in their feet, but on their head. Or you can dip their head into water, but the water has to flow over their head. And while you do this, while you pour water in their head, you say their name. That's what the N is for on the screen. Name, maybe Susie or John, Adam or Eve. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Again, their name, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. Then you call your local priest right away. Uh, make sure you inform of all the details so you can record it properly. And if the person somehow miraculously is still alive, you can make sure the person gets confirmation in the Eucharist. But again, this should only be an emergency. If grandma uh, baptizes the grandkids in the bathtub, that is a mortal sin. Only do this when this is the absolute emergency. But everyone should know how to do it, just in case. Now, what does baptism do? Baptism takes away sin. Why did Christ come? He came to the crib to come to the cross. He came to take away our sins. And so Adam and Eve, they transmit to us original sin. The sin of Adam is passed on to every child of Adam. Each one of us in this world are children of Adam. And so we have original sin, which blocks us from grace, which blocks us from heaven. So original sin is washed away in baptism. Now, if someone is not baptized for some reason until after they are seven years old, after the age of what we call reason, when they're able to discern things properly, then their personal sin is taken away also, right? A child, an infant is not capable of personal sin, but they do have original sin. But if someone over seven, who's considered an adult in the church, is baptized, even their personal sin is taken away. Grace, grace is given to us in, in the back baptism. Grace is like an elevator. It raises us up to God. It takes our nature and elevates it to a new level, to a new mountaintop. It unites us to Christ. And so grace comes in two main different forms, sanctifying and actual. And sanctifying is the one we want to focus on here. We're not born with grace. Grace can only be given to us by Christ through the fruit of his passion, the fruit of his blood given to us in the sacraments. So baptism gives us sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the key to heaven. Right? If you don't have the right code, you can't get into a lock. If you don't have the right key, you can't get into the door. Sanctifying grace is what gets us into heaven. It's Christ's blood in us. And so if I commit, if I commit a mortal sin, if anyone commits a mortal sin after baptism, the sanctifying grace goes away. If they go to confession to a priest and they're truly repentant, the sanctifying grace returns, can even increase with the more love the person has. Sanctifying grace is the great gift given to us. This is very important. Baptism is not some kind of social ritual. Baptism is not some kind of way we present the person to the community. Baptism is about sin and about grace. Sin being taken away and grace being given. It also initiates the person into the Catholic Church to initiate us, to make us a member of the Catholic Church. And this is why someone should only be baptized if they will be raised in the faith. If there's no well-founded hope that someone will be raised in the faith, in the Catholic faith, then they cannot be baptized. Because as a member of the church, there are certain obligations and duties that Christ calls upon you. And so it would be cruel to baptize someone who would never live up those duties. And so baptism makes us a member of the church. Finally, baptism is necessary for salvation. This is very controversial. Many people don't talk about it today. But baptism is necessary. Christ established it for the means for our salvation. Now, it is true, it is true that God is bigger than the sacraments. God can work uh, around the sacraments just like he can work around the laws of physics. The, uh, he can perform miracles when Christ multiplied the loaves, when Christ turned water into wine. He broke because he is God. He went around the laws of nature. And God can do the same thing with 
the sacraments with grace. So, for example, in the early church, there were certain people who wanted to be baptized, but died while professing Christ before their baptism. We say they, they died by a baptism of desire or a baptism of blood. Now, God is capable of saving people without baptism, but it's very, very hard. It's very hard. And so it's uh, in this ta our current age, some priests tend to emphasize the fact that God can save anyone outside of baptism, and they underemphasize, sadly, the necessity of baptism. And I think it should be the reverse. We need in this age to emphasize baptism is God's will. Baptism is God's will. It's his ordinary, it's his way to save us. And so if we uh, shirk baptism, if we say, I don't, if someone refused to be baptized, they cannot be saved. If someone uh, fails in their duty to baptize their children, that's a grave mortal sin on their soul. Baptism is necessary for salvation. We need to emphasize that more today. Finally, let's talk about the role of godparents and parents. Godparents play a very special role in the life of the child's faith. They're there to provide spiritual support, to pray for the child, to uh, have graces merited for the child. Um, and so in order to be to provide that spiritual support, a godparent must be a baptized Catholic and they must be confirmed. So they must be a baptized Catholic and they must be confirmed. They're, they're also there, godparents, to ensure that the child will be raised in the faith, in the Catholic faith. So if the parents stop going to church, the godparents' job is to tell them, hey, get back to church. If the parents leave the church and join another denomination, if the godparents' duty to tell them, hey, get back to the Catholic church, the only ark of salvation. If the parents fail in any way to provide moral discipline or found, uh, formation, it's the godparents' duty to correct the parents. Now, in the sad event that the parents would die, it's also the God's parents' duty to make sure the child is raised in the faith by those who raise the child in the Catholic faith. And so to be a godparent, to help make sure the child is brought up in the faith, they must be someone who knows the faith and practices the faith, who receive the sacraments frequently, go to mass or confession, and have a regular prayer life. They also have to be an example to the child of live Catholic faith. And so if they live in a state of sin, they cannot be godparents because you can't be a good example of the faith if you're living in a state of sin. So those who are divorced and remarried and they're remarried outside the church, they cannot be godparents. Or those who are uh, living and cohabitating with uh, a significant other, a romantic relationship, uh, they cannot uh, be godparents unless they have their, child, their marriage blessed in the church or if they get married in the church or they live, as, live singly, they live by themselves, not with a romantic partner. If you have someone who wants to be a godparent but doesn't te technically qualify, please have them call me or you call me. Maybe we can work it out. Maybe we can have their marriage blessed. Maybe we can move up their wedding date. Maybe we can, uh, might be some kind of way we can provide a remedy to their situation so they can be right with God and therefore be uh, eligible to be a godparent. Now, what about parents? Parents are given this beautiful, awesome task to raise ch children. God loves us so much, and God's wisdom is so profound that he has us participate, us participate in the formation of children. And this is a beautiful gift that parents have, a beautiful duty and privilege. And so the key to be a parent is holiness, holiness. You can't be a good parent without striving for holiness. Now, maybe in your life, before this moment, you sinned a whole lot. Maybe you haven't been living a good holy life. Maybe you've been away from God. Maybe your parents didn't teach you that much about the faith. Maybe you have all kinds of things in your life. Well, guess what? God can still make you holy. He wants you to be holy. If there's a little voice in your head that says, well, not me, I can't be holy. I've sinned too much. Or I can't be holy, I have not learned the faith enough. Or I'm not, I can't be holy, I'm too busy. That voice is from the devil. Ignore that voice. God wants you to be holy. Christ shed his blood for you to be holy. Seek holiness. Right? God made you in his image and likeness, and he wants to redeem you. You can be holy. Now, holiness, you know, part of the parent's job is to lead the family in holiness by their example. By their example. So parents, moms, and dads need to make sure they have a daily prayer life. If you don't have a daily prayer life, start off with the rosary daily, which takes 15 minutes, or reading scripture daily. 
You must go to confession. Uh, I recommend going to confession frequently, about once a month. Right? It's hard to live a holy life. We need that grace of confession so we have a clean soul, so we can go into the workplace with a heart that is pure, so we can battle against sin. Frequent confession to the Catholic priest is a, a good way to grow in holiness, a necessary way. Also, Sunday Mass, right? If we miss Mass, as we know, it's a mortal sin. So holiness is tied into intending Mass and to holy study as a family, studying the faith, studying scriptures, and performing works of mercy for those in need. Another obligation of parents is to educate their children. Now, by education, I don't mean um, the kind of modern way we mean of education, of just learning facts. I mean the classical way. Education means formation. It means leading someone into virtue. So part of your role and task as a parent is to lead your child into natural virtue, into courage, into temperance, into prudence and wisdom, to fortitude, to make sure your child will be a courageous child, to form them into being a prudent child, a just person. These things are part of your duty as a parent. You're also to ensure that children grow in their morality, that they choose the right and uh, reject the wrong, that they choose good, what's of God, and reject what is not of God, to follow God's law. And also their spiritual formation, that they fall in love with Jesus Christ, that they fall in love with Mary, they fall in love with the saints, they fall in love with the sacraments. And so how do you do this? Well, by your example, but also by praying with a child on a daily basis, family prayer, the Holy Rosary at night, it's a great way to do this. Having images of Mary and the saints and our Lord all around your house, help your children fall into love with Christ. Bring them to the sacraments, making sure that they get religious education and that you teach them at home the faith. It's not enough just to drop off our kid at the catechism. We must teach them on our own. Also disciplining and protecting. The role of the parents is to discipline, not to be the friend of the child, but to be the one who provides those boundaries in order for the child to grow in holiness, right? You cannot be truly happy without holiness. And so discipline is an important role. Also protecting your children from bad influences. The first seven years of a child's formation are critically important. So your job as a parent, your privilege, your duty is to protect them from bad influences. What I'm about to say is controversial, but I think it's very important pastorally to talk about. First of all, we have to remember that the ideal, the ideal is for moms to stay at home, especially during those seven years of the child's life in the beginning, the formation of those first seven years. And many people might uh, balk at this. They might be offended by this. They might think, well, are you giving women a second class role in society? No, quite the opposite. A mother's role is key to bring about uh, the formation of a child. It's a beautiful, God has given women the intelligence the mental faculty, the emotional IQ, all the spiritual and natural resources to help their children grow in faith and grow in formation and grow in discipline and virtue. It's a beautiful gift that God has given mothers. So mothers could do this best. And so daycare, even though daycare could be run by great people who are holy people, there's a danger that our children will learn bad things from the other kids, pick up bad habits. So really, uh, frequent daycare is something we should pull away from. And I understand some parents, they have to both work. I understand that sometimes, but that should only be an absolute necessity. Those first seven years are very formative for the child. We want to protect the child from bad influence, even when they get older, right? We make sure, what are they watching on TV? Are we monitoring what they see on the internet? Are we, are we too soon giving them internet devices without having any kind of accountability or monitoring software? You know, are we letting our kids spend the night at people's houses with, and they can be influenced in bad ways? Your job as a parent is to discipline and protect. Take that rule seriously. It's a grave thing, right? When you die, parents, you will be judged on your parenting. If you parented well, your happiness to heaven will be that much more increased. If you parented poorly, your pains in hell will be that much more intense. Now, this is not a happy thing to think about. And it's not a happy way to close a video on baptism. Baptism is a joyful day, a beautiful day. It's a day we should rejoice and have the family together and celebrate. But we have to remember there's a certain gravity to this. There's a beautiful weightiness to it. That God uh, is giving you the privilege, the duty, and the grace. He'll give you the grace if you stay close to him, if you live a holy life, to be a parent. A beautiful gift that God has given to parents. 
And so we thank parents for their saying yes to this, and we pray for parents that they grow in holiness. And God bless y'all guys. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. God bless you.